Today's speaker in the famous Rutgers University Experimental Mass Seminar is the one and only Neil Sloan, who will talk about Conan's gasket, Rekaman variations, the Enot Woolley sequence, and stained glass windows. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Zalberger, for inviting me to speak. I believe this is the 17th year of your famous experimental math seminar, so it's an honor to be here. I'm going to talk about a handful of recent sequences. Um, and the way to get the next slide is to, I see, click the arrows. All right. So I'm going to, um, the, the, these are a handful of sequences that have come in in the past year to the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, the OEIS. And they're the kind of sequences that make you want to drop everything and work on them. And unfortunately, there are still several unsolved questions in each of these cases. Okay. And okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, so, um, there, and there are going to be four segments, each about 10 minutes long. And I'm hoping, really hoping that someone, some of you will be able to solve some of these questions. So the first one is the Enots Wally sequence that was sent in by Scott Shannon, who lives in Melbourne, where I used to live. And um, Enots Wally is a very... Hello? I heard music. I guess somebody didn't mute themselves. Um, okay, so the Enots Wally sequence. Enots Wally is a very Australian sounding name. It could well be the name of a politician. Uh, for instance, someone who looks like that, that, that could be Enots known as Snotty Wally. Um, but it's not. In fact, this is not named after an old geezer. It's named after a geyser. And it's an example of a sequence of a, fam a family of sequences called the LES sequences. And the, these are sequences that, that have the property that they're the lexicographically earliest infinite sequence of distinct positive numbers satisfying some condition. And if there's no other condition, well, the lexicographically earliest infinite sequence of distinct positive numbers is simply one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, the natural numbers, sequence A27 in the OAIS. The Enots Wally is the third, actually more like the fourth or fifth in a chain of sequences. And the first one is the classical EKG sequence. It's called EKG because it, a, a graph of it looks a bit like what you see when the doctor measures your heartbeats. It goes up and down a little bit in a fairly regular manner. And the definition is that the nth term has to have a common factor with the previous term. That's all, starting at the third term. So, and you want the lexicographically earliest sequence with that property. So, well, it could begin one, two. There are no constraints on the first two terms. So let's try that. That's going to work. And so that will be the start. After the two, we need, a num we need a number that has a common factor with two. So an even number and the smallest even number we haven't seen is four. So it begins one, two, four, and then six, and then three. We can get a three in there because it's got a common factor with, with six and so on. So that's the EKG sequence. And it's not too difficult to prove that every number appears. This is a permutation of the positive integers. Then, slightly more complicated, the Yellowstone permutation. The, the Yellowstone it is defined by the property. It's the lexicographically earliest infinite sequence, blah, 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 satisfying the condition that there's a common factor between the, the new term, A of n, and the term that's two steps back. And it must be relatively prime to the term one step back to the previous term. So, and that must take over after three steps, from the fourth step on. So there's actually no reason we can't begin in the greedy way with beginning with one, two, three. And then the next term could be four, and a four works because it's got a common factor with two and it's relatively primed to three. Good, just what we needed. And what's the next term? Well, it has to have a common factor with three, and six is ruled out because six and four have a common factor but nine works, and so on. So that's the Yellowstone permutation. And it's called the Yellowstone permutation because every so often it erupts like the Yellowstone geyser. 
you can see here 35 appears rather bigger than its neighbors and so on. And we've analyzed that. Um, uh, there are a lot of unsolved questions, but we can certainly prove that this is a permutation of the positive numbers. Well, okay, what about Enoch's Wally? Obviously, Enoch's Wally is Yellowstone backwards. It's the same as the Yellowstone, but with reversal of the two conditions. So now, the, the, the term we're looking for has to have a common factor of the previous term and be relatively prime to the term two steps back. So we begin one and two, and, and that should happen from the third step on. So we can begin with one and two, and it works. So that's the beginning, one, two. Now, what about the next term? You would say, well, it could be four, because four has a common factor with two, and it's relatively prime to one. However, if we took it to be four, there would be no way to pick the next term, because there's no number that could go here. There's no number that has, has a common factor with four and is relatively prime to two. Impossible. So we've got to have a new prime coming in. So we bring in three and we get six. And if we look at the prime factors of the first few terms, you'll see what's happening. We start with two and then the next term so, so the rows tell you what the prime factors are. So um, the third term is six, we've got a two and a three. The next term, what is it? Well, we've got to have a common factor, which is either two or three, and it's got to be relatively prime to two. So we've got to have a three. And the smallest extra prime we could bring in is five. So three times five, 15 is the smallest possible candidate, and that works. So that's what we take. And we can say more or less precisely what the next term is always. So let me denote by the kernel of a number, the set of prime factors of the number. So the kernel of one is the empty set. It has no prime factors. The kernel of 12 is the set of uh, consisting of two and three. So the conditions that are required by the definition are that A of M, well, it, it may or may not be the smallest, but in fact, the smallest number works. Consider a, the smallest number m, not in the sequence, whose kernel intersects the kernel of the previous term, is disjoint from the kernel of the term two back, and has a new prime in it. That number m is easy to see. It always exists. It's unique. And obviously, a of n can't be less than that. So it works. And so we can take it to be that, and we go on to the next term. And so this always works, and this is what the sequence is. It consists of those numbers. Well, okay, it doesn't contain every number because we've got to have at least two different primes in every term. So we're not gonna get four ever. So this is not a permutation of the positive integers. However, it does seem that it's a permutation of all the numbers that have at least two prime factors together with one and two. The first two terms are a bit special. So there's the conjecture open. While preparing the slide over the last few days, I've almost proved it, but not quite. And of course, that doesn't mean a thing. So wh what I can show is, well, the sequence is, is infinite. We did that already. I can prove that for any prime p, p divides some term. Uh, for, for any, and then, using that for any prime p, p divides infinitely many terms. And then, for any prime p, any odd prime p, there is a term 2p that appears naked on its own. And those are the first few steps in the proof that the Yellowstone permutation is indeed a permutation. But the last step doesn't carry over. And there are various things that might work for the next step. For instance, it would be nice to show that every even number that's, um, except for powers of two, bigger than, bigger than two, every even number appears. And I cannot prove that. It would be very nice to have some help here. And Neil, since this is about prime numbers, it's possibly that it's very, very deep in the same, bulk, uh, the same league of the Goldbach or whatever. So it may be very, very hard. It may be. It, it may be. I've no. I've seen no no smell of that possibility in any of this class of sequences. 
it what it needs mostly i think is coffee it's it's just a matter of seeing the right path okay. you you could be right um i hope not the, or maybe it would be very nice if it was um a, 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 a goldbach conjecture status but I'm, I'm afraid it's just going to take someone, some clever grad student to solve this. So that's the, um, oh, so, so I won't even, I've t told you already the first few steps in the proof that the Yellowstone is a, is a, a permutation. It's just the last step that doesn't carry over. And um, I have the details of the proof of the EKG sequence, but they're even simpler. So that's the end of the first segment, and um, I will continue immediately with the next segment. So recently, earlier this year, a group of us, namely Joseph Myers, Rich Chappell, uh, Scott Shannon, Paul Zimmerman, and myself, um, uh, wrote a paper about three cousins of Rachman's sequence. And it's going to appear in the Fibonacci Quarterly, and it's on the archive. And the reason Paul Zimmerman is a co-author is very interesting. He announced in February of this year that he and a group of other people had factored one of the RSA challenge numbers, a 250 digit number. They factorized it and it took 2,700 years, physical years of computer time. And I thought, wow, that is unbelievable. And he will be just the person we need <laughs> to help with the third of the cousins. The first two cousins were pretty interesting, but didn't take us anywhere really new. They, in the end, they turned out to be related to sequences that were already in the OEIS in a slightly tenuous way, but it was basically routine, although there are still some questions we can't answer. But the third cousin called C of N, C stands because it's the third letter, it's C, and it's also C stands for concatenate. And I have to say this is a base dependent sequence. Well, I'm not apologizing for that. I think it's very, very interesting. It's astonishingly interesting. So C of N, it's a sequence. And let me tell you how to construct it. Take n equals one. What's the first term? Well, we start with one. The next term after one is two. And is, does two divide one? No. So we glue two to one and we get 12. And the next term is three. We say, is 12 divisible by three? Well, yes. And that took one step before we got a successful division. So c of one is one. Let me go to n equals eight. Um, the, what's the eighth term? We start with eight and the next number is nine. And we say, is, does nine divide eight? No. So glue it on and we get 89. Is 89 divisible by 10? Obviously not. So we glue on 10 to the, to the end of 89 and we get 8910. We get the number 8,910 and we say, is that divisible by 11? Well, yes, it is, luckily. And that, that took two steps, so C of 8 is 2. And that's the rule. For n equals 7, which is slightly harder, you start with 7, glue on 8 and 9 and 10. You have to go all the way up to 20 before we get a number. There's the number that's divisible by the next, by 21. And that takes 13 steps. So C of 7 is 13. If we start with 2, it's even more difficult. We have to go, we have to glue together two, three, four, five, all the way up to 82. We have to go forward 80 steps before we get a division. So C of two is 80. And in fact, we're not even certain that this process always stops. So we define C of n to be minus one if this division, concatenation and division process continues forever. And um, what we know, <laughs> Here are the values of the first 100 terms. They're rather irregular. So C of 1 is, 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 is 1. You saw that. C of 2 is 80. C of 8 is 2. C of 7 is 13, and so on. C of 18 is 124,000. It goes along in a modestly 
complicated way till you get to 44. What is C of 44? At this point, we ran into trouble. And this is where um, I sent an email to Paul Zimmerman and Joseph Miles also got involved. And they being much better programmers than I managed to um, write a series of programs <laughs> ever more sophisticated programs that finally found the 44th term. And it is this 13 digit number. Now look at what this means. We start off with 44. We try, the next term is 45, it doesn't divide. So we, div we get 4, 4, 4, 5, 4, 6, 4, 7. We keep gluing all these numbers together until we get up to this 13 digit number. Now that means this is a pretty big number. It's a number with, well, it's, about, it's got about this many um, numbers glued together and each of them has about 13 digits. So it's about a number with about 10 to the 14 digits. So it's a, a number about as big as 10 to the 10 to the 14. And you have to take that and see if it's divisible by a number like this. So this is not something you can do on your ordinary computer with any kind of naive algorithm. But um, uh, Paul and Joseph managed to do it, and they found this number. Until they found it, we were quite worried. We felt that maybe C of 44 is minus one. There's no divisibility ever, but there is. And we've gone out to 1,000 now, and we know the values of C of n for all numbers except two cases. We, we know C of 539, which is a tough one, it's at most this 15 digit number. It could be less, but it probably isn't. But we know it's at least 10 to the 14. And C of 158, we have not found any candidate that works. So it, it's either minus one or at least 10 to the 14. And the conjecture is that, it's, that it does exist. We conjecture that this number always exists, that um, it's a mystery. So that's the end of the second segment. The third segment is about the Conant Gasket. This was created, I think, in a Bridges talk a year ago by Jim Conant. And the sequence was sent in by Robert Fathauer. And um, uh, it's a gasket. It's, it's a fractal. And I'll show you the construction, which is very nice. The construction is you take a square and you divide it up into more and more little pieces pieces get smaller and smaller and the number increases and the question is how many pieces are there so we start off generation zero with a square then we go down to the base and find the midpoint and draw a vertical line that gives us two regions now so a of one is two now we go to the left side find the midpoint and draw a horizontal line now we have three regions now we go back to the base and subdivide each of these um, intervals here into two pieces and draw vertical lines. Then we go to the left hand side, subdivide each of these regions into two and draw horizontal lines. But you notice the line goes along here until it hits this vertical line and then it goes underneath and surfaces and it's a kind of a weaving process. You, you go along in your horizontal or vertical line until you hit the next perpendicular line. And when you do, you disappear underneath and then you pop up again. It's a, a weaving process. And that was the fourth generation, fifth, sixth, seventh. Here's the 10th generation. There are 325 regions and you can see they're getting smaller and smaller and they are in fact a bit fractally because you can see that this square here is reproduced on a different scale here and so on. And um, Robert Fathar produced this beautiful colored picture of 16 generations when there are 17,000 odd regions. And you can see the red squares show the fractal structure and the blue and the yellow and the white. So it's very fractally. And the question is, how many regions are there? Well, when we got to 33 terms, GFUN, the wonderful program that Bruno Salvi and Paul Zimmerman, their Maple program for guessing generating functions, that was able to guess a generating function and a recurrence. 
And the recurrence seems to be a linear recurrence of degree 12, 12th order. Each term depends on the previous 12 terms. And um, that was true after 33 terms. We've now computed, last night, Remy Segrist computed um, a couple more terms. So now we have terms 0 to 42. It's sequence A328078, if you want to see them all. And this recurrence still holds. So, it, and there's nothing particularly mysterious about this recurrence. It doesn't have any zeros near the unit circle or anything suspicious. It seems to be right, but we can't prove it. When you try to prove it, you run into problems because it's hard actually to get your hands on these things. So, Doug McElroy, my old colleague, said, because these, if, if we draw it on a large piece of graph paper, there are actually two lattices that you get. Here's the even lattice. So now instead of chopping up a unit square into little pieces, we keep all the uh, little squares of size one and just build it up, filling up the infinite uh, first quadrant. And at each point, this was Doug McElroy's suggestion, r make a note of whether there's a vertical line or a horizontal line. So we define V of ij to be one if there's a vertical line at position ij in the integer lattice and in the first quadrant, and hij to be one if and only if there's a horizontal line. And then every time you get a cell, it's got a bottom left corner where both V and H are one, because you've got a vertical line in ours. So if we multiply Vij and Hij and take the Hadamard product of these two sequences, we get the number of cells at an even generation. And you can translate the definition of the lattice into recurrences for V and H. And there's an additional property that pops up if you look at it, if you stare at it long enough, and I've stared at these for a long time, if you look at the fourth generation, is G4. The fifth generation is here. And if you focus your attention on the left-hand half of this picture and transpose it in a line through the two blue arrows, you get this picture on a different scale. These two bars here, two vertical rectangles, become those two rectangles. This horizon horizontal rectangle becomes this one, and that corner rectangle becomes a square. You go from here to here by reflecting and stretching, or compressing, depending on your scale. And that yes. gives... And can you prove the recurrence, this complicated recurrence, and model all this the conjecture relating V and H? No, no. And no. I think, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can pro actually prove these two conjectures uh, are consequences of the basic definition um, recurrences. But no, I, we haven't been able to get, I think the fact that this is a Hadamard product suggests that it may be complicated, but doable. That's my hope anyway. Um, the, the reason I called this a gasket at the beginning was that Robert Fatow pointed out that in, if instead of starting with um, a square, we start with a triangle, an equilateral triangle, and instead of alternating between the base and the left side, if we go around all three sides in turn, we get the Sapinski gasket. Look, start with a triangle, draw find the midpoint of the base, draw a line, go to the right side, find the midpoint, draw a line, and so on. After six steps, you get this. After nine steps, you get the next generation of Sierpinski. But it's different from the uh, original Conant construction because it goes around all sides and it's based on a triangle. So I thought it would be interesting to see what happens if we start with a square and go around all the sides. And um, Remy Segrist worked out the numbers and some pictures, um, and it's sequence 335703. And after 16 generations, we get this. I was expecting to see a gasket, a fractal, a kind of uh, like the Sapinski fractal. I do not see any fractal structure here whatsoever. 
this was a great disappointment or actually very interesting. What on earth is going on? If you blow up the middle of the picture, you see something that looks like this. This is totally alien to the human race, as far as I can tell. This, this, this looks like something you might have found left behind on Mars when the aliens left. <laughs> um, it's a mystery. Uh, I'm doing well for time. Any questions? Uh, otherwise, let me continue with the, the final segment. This is joint work with Lars Bromberg, Scott Shannon, and part one is now in the archive. And um, the, it, it's about graphical enumeration and stained glass windows. And the motivation for this is things like this. This is one of the great Gothic cathedrals of the world in Amiens in France. And it has rose windows that are just amazing. And there are, in Paris, in the Saint-Chapelle, there are rectangular stained glass windows, just unbelievably beautiful. So that was part of our motivation was to make, I've always wanted to make stained glass windows that sort of looked like that. And the mathematical motivation was to extend the work of uh, Poonen Rubenstein and Legendre Griffiths on um, the complete graph. They analyzed the complete graph on end nodes and the complete bipartite graph. And I have always thought it would be interesting to generalize their work to other families of graphs. But we haven't always succeeded. And our motto has been, if we can't solve it, we make art. Anyway, so what did um, Bjorn Funen and Michael Rubinstein do? They took the standard drawing of the complete graph on endpoints. Here's K23. You take 23 points around a, a circle or a polygon with 23 sides, and you join every pair of points by a line. So you get a very complicated graph. And the questions are, how many little cells are there? How many intersection points? And how many edges in this graph? And by Euler's theorem, we only need two of those. Well, for this particular case, K23, it turns out there are about, about 9,000 little cells and about 9,000 nodes in the graph in tier, uh, total. And those two numbers are roughly equal. And what that tells us is that most of these nodes are simple nodes. Most of the nodes have degree four. There are very relatively very few nodes where three or more lines cross. Most of the interior nodes are simple nodes where just two lines cross. And um, here is a color drawing, a stained glass window of that same K23 produced by our secret coloring algorithm. It's actually not secret, it's in the paper, but it's nice to refer to it as a secret algorithm. And um, that was KN, the complete graph on N nodes. The other f family that's been analyzed are the complete bipartite graphs, KNN. You know, K33 is the famous non-planar utilities graph where you have three houses and you have uh, gas, water, and electricity, and you want to connect every house to every utility and you get a non-planar graph. And here's K44, four utilities, four points on a line, and four houses, four points on a different line. And you want to join every point to ev every utility to every house. Join every pair of these points by a line. Well, that's K44. That's the standard drawing of K44. We have been studying this quite hard, and we th prefer to think of this as not being four points on a row, but as being three squares side by side, like this. So here's, we call it BC13. It's an array of squares, one deep and three across, and we join every pair of points by a line. And then the question is, how many little cells are there, how many points, and how many edges? Well. That was solved by um, uh, um, Stefan Legendre and Martin Griffiths. So we've been looking at a generalization where we start off with an M by M, M by N grid of squares. So here's BC33. And we um, have colored it with our secret algorithm. 
producing something that you can uh, print out and hang in your church if you want. And this is called BC33 because these are boundary, co boundary chords. We take boundary points and join them by chords. This is BC33. And if you want to see more pictures of BCMN, look at sequence A331452. It has quite a number of striking pictures like these. This is BC92. This is sort of a little bit like the Saint-Chapelle windows. This is BC92 colored in through different ways. On the left-hand side, it's color coded to tell you how many sides there are in the little pieces of glass in the cells. Red means a triangular piece of glass. Um, orange means a four-sided piece and so on. And the most sides any piece has is eight. There are two little segments that are octagonal cells. Here's the same graph colored by our secret algorithm. So let me talk a bit about um, BC1N. Here's BC14. If you look at it, you see there are 104 cells and there are 70 triangular cells and 34 four-sided cells. And there are no pentagons and there are no hexagons. Here's a four-sided cell and here's a three-sided cell, no pentagons. Why is that? Well, what Stéphane Legendre and Martin Griffiths did was to work out the number of nodes in BC1N and the number of cells. And they can be expressed in terms of a function V. V is basically a double sum over all pairs of numbers A and B that are relatively prime of A times B. There's some extra extra stuff thrown in. But it's basically the sum, double sum, over A and B over in a square or a rectangle, summed over all pairs which are relatively prime or have GCD2. And if you know those quantities, then you can work out what the num nodes, number of nodes and number of cells are. Well, um, Max Alexeyev, when he was editing one of these sequences, pointed out that their results are equivalent to results that he and his colleagues had found for enumerating training sets for threshold functions in the plane. There are two papers. But he, he said, we have a result that was not given by uh, Legendre and Griffiths. They prove that all the cells are either triangles or quadrilaterals. It was no accident there were no pentagons in BC14. There are no pentagons. There's nothing bigger than a quadrilateral in BC1N for any N. But the proof of that depends on a result about training sets for threshold functions. And furthermore, it's in Russian. And it would be very nice. This is a pretty simple geometric fact. Find a proof that if you take um, uh, n squares side by side and draw all the diagonals. Excuse me. And you did not notice this fact that only triangles and quadrilaterals showed up before? Uh, no, it wasn't known. No. Uh, uh, the, the earlier two people had overlooked that. But you did, it, it didn't occur to you by looking at it. Is that no. what well, it, um, I didn't really study this very hard until Max Alexeyev pointed out this, this the connection with threshold functions. Um, so uh, what we don't have, it's true, the theorem, theorem eight there, but it would be nice to have a purely geometrical proof. So this is the kind of thing you can think about when you're walking along a sidewalk that's it's got square paving stones. Take four or five adjacent, paving stones, join all the points by lines. Why are there no pentagons? It would be very nice to know. Another thing you can look at is the nodes. I was just talking about the cells in that graph. What about the internal nodes? It seems that most of them are simple. It's very rare to have a graph, to have a node where more than two lines cross. Um, what I'm talking about is like here. If you look, this is BC13. You can see most of the vertices 
only uh, are intersections of two chords. It's very rare. I think there are just three points here where more than two lines meet. So that's a pretty simple definition. Number of interior nodes in BC1N where just two chords cross. And the numbers, well, the, I just showed you the six for the uh, case of um, one by three. One by three, one by two. Anyway, so the sequence goes one, six, 24, 54. What are these numbers? We have 500 terms of this sequence and it's got a very simple geometric definition. And yet we can't even guess a formula for it. This happens all the time. This is really annoying. We, we end up, we come across a sequence. We're trying to understand. We have hundreds of terms. There's a simple definition. And none of the existing computer programs like SuperSeeker or Rata or the other programs, GFUN, can, are capable of guessing a formula or a recurrence or something. So I think it would be very nice to have an intelligent, uh, some maybe an AI program that would take the sequence we're interested in, compare it with all 340,000 sequences in the OEIS and look for some connection, some, a smart guessing program. It would be really very nice. Another thing that we, ha we spent a lot of time looking at BC2N, but I don't, really have time to talk about that. But we noticed that in BC2N, like that example of the nine by two graph, I showed you where the biggest uh, number of sides was eight. It's, uh, it seems that eight is the most any cell has in BC2N. And for N bigger than 18, there are most six sides. And uh, it's just a conjecture. Here are the numbers of nodes and cells in BCMN, as M and N vary. And uh, here's BC12. It's got 13 nodes and 16 cells. So we have a great deal of data. We understand the first row and column from the Legendre Griffiths result, but we don't have formulas for anything else. That's the main question in this section of the, of the in this part of the paper. Um, we have 37 rows and columns of this of this uh, table of numbers. And we haven't made much headway. The one thing we have done is find an upper bound on the number of nodes and on the number of edges, which is, uh, is pretty tight. But that's all. Um, I, I want to end up by thanking all the people who keep the OEIS running, the editors, the systems admins, the trustees of the OEIS Foundation. Um, without them, it, we, we could not exist. The uh, um, database is doing well. We accept about 33 new sequences every day. We've been cited about 9,000 times in the literature. We get half a million requests per day and we need more editors. There's no pay, but it's very much fun. So I'll stop there. Please unmute yourself and yeah. applaud. Yes, please, everyone. Thank Neil Sloan for... Hooray! Yeah. It's also a nice Excellent. clapping yeah. option you can pick somewhere. <laughs> Are there any questions for Neil? Uh, I wonder, will this be documented somewhere? Like what is what we've been talking about and for other people to review? Well, <coughs> excuse me. I think the talk will be recorded and it'll be available on the experimental mathematics. Um, the, the seminar website will have a record of it. And the paper, the, the, the uh, all of the stuff will eventually be published. The, the last part, one part of it is on the archive already, and there'll be another part um, that will be finished soon. So it's basically all documented, yes. All right, thank you. Neil, I have so a question. Can you find it later on, like in archive or some other place maybe? No, well, not the whole thing. I don't think that's appropriate. I'm not sure. Um, but the parts, I don't know. I mean, okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Neil, I was wondering, what exactly were you looking for out of your more intelligent sequence finder? I mean, I, I can't think of many good ways to try and guess sequences if you're not using, you know, C finite or P recursive, you know, something that's like has a, a well-known structure that you can make guesses with. Well, you could compare. Uh, so one one thing that I think would be very nice and not difficult to do would be to take the, the mystery sequence S and compare it with all the 340,000 sequences that we have and, and rule out any obviously inappropriate ones and uh, run something like GFUN on them to see maybe do some correlation to see if they're uh, similar. Another thing you w one could do is to classify them according to the kind of sequence. Like a, a great many of them grow exponentially and things that have the same kind of exponential growth, uh, th things that have the same kind of exponential growth could, could well be candidates for relating. There's also the question of drawing a big graph um, that several people have thought about. So you draw a very large graph with three, 340,000 nodes and you try to draw an edge connecting pairs of sequences that are related in some way, maybe having a common reference or some words in common or uh, something that suggests that they should be related in some way. And that would also narrow down the possibilities. You'd, you'd uh, compare your sequence with the main nodes in the graph. Is there any way to have the whole LIAS on one file or it's too much? So people can do their own comparison? Yes, certain cert certainly. You, you can download um, two files freely. One has all the data terms of every sequence with its A number, and another has the description of every uh, sequence with its A number. And if people are serious about this, I'll be happy to give them a copy of the whole database. The, the, the database is on punch cards, virtual punch cards. <laughs> it's, it's one of the largest uh, collections of punch cards ever made. Uh, a, a few million punch cards. And um, yeah, it's available if you ask me. <laughs> So for for tracking duplications or almost uh, the same that's done routinely. Yes, um, there there are several editors who um, Georg Fischer, for example, very often looks, and also Richard Mata, um, editors who often look for du duplicates. But there are also obvious uh, similarities, like duplicate uh, doubles or difference. I no, that, that's not done so routinely. No, not at all. That would be worth doing, of course. Yeah, yeah, that would be a nice project. Especially if it found things that were surprising, as it surely would. What, what was that again, to just find duplicates? Well, or near duplicates. So, it, for instance, it might turn out that one sequence was the binomial transform of another. And that would be very interesting if it wasn't known already or one was twice another or things like that. Super Seeker will take your sequence and do all those things to it to see if the result is in the OAIS. It'll take your sequence and take the binomial transform or the Mobius transform and see if that matches. It does 125 or so transformations and looks them up in the OAIS. It's a freely available program. It's called SuperSeeker. And if you send email to superseeker at oeis.com, it'll give you instructions. Is this uh, part about the gas conant gasket? You ask a formula for A of 2n. Is there a formula for A of 2n plus 1? Yes. Um, the, the formula is actually for A of n, the conjectured recurrence. And so you can bisect that and get the formula for A of 2n. Now, I should have said, I should have stressed that the formula that I put down, the degree 12 linear recurrence, that's for A of n, both, both the yes, even and odd. Yes, that is simpler for... No, it's not. The even of the odd, no? Oh. No, it's, the, it's just, it doesn't simplify. Okay. <laughs> I tried that, of course, yeah. And, you know, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, so for that C of N sequence, has anyone looked at a binary version of that? 
Um, C of N. Um, yes. Um, the the cousin. You know, I forget. I'm sorry. It has I, a similar behavior where some of the numbers are huge, but we think they all exist. I actually don't remember. I'm sorry. Okay. And if, the other... they'll, if you look at the cross references in that sequence, it will tell you. Okay. Uh, and then my other question is about those, um, the BM, the BCMNs. So I have, a, I'm going to make a statement and uh, I want you to tell me if it's known, if you know that it's false, you think it's true or neither. So my statement is for fixed M, for sufficiently large N, BCMN contains only triangles and quadrilaterals. No, already for BC2N, th there are hexagons. But, but we know the hexagons persist for N getting very large. Um, uh, yes, we don't know okay. it for sure, but it's conjectured to be true. It seems obviously true. Yes. Okay. It's a bit, this is a bit like a wearing problem. It, uh, there, there are things, are irregularities at the beginning, but if you go out far enough, you know, every number is the sum of so many cubes or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, for BC, we, it must not be hard, I think, to prove that there are hexagons always. But I don't know of any formal proof, no. But it's surely true. All right, thank you. For the Rekanam sequence, these huge numbers, uh, how frequent, and so usually the numbers are not so big. So all of a sudden you have this huge, for example, C of 44, and still C of 158, it's still open. So, so you needed to use some very big computers and very <laughs> big, uh, <laughs> we, we need some very clever programmers and also very big computers i guess because no i don't think so not especially big oh okay no, no. the the algorithm is in the paper the 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 main uh, it's a sieving algorithm um and uh Basically, it assumes that you, 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 you're looking at a chain, you're always concatenating numbers of the same size. And so you, you can, there are a lot of shortcuts you can do to figure out um, what you're in a kind of arithmetic progression and you can use shortcuts. So, so is it surprising that once in a while you get huge numbers and then yes. they get smaller? Yeah. Yes, we, we, we cannot explain that. There's a, you can give a, a, a very sloppy probabilistic argument that the, the numbers should exist, but we haven't been able to refine that heuristic argument to give any hint of why there are such huge, huge fluctuations. It's an open question. Yeah, it's fascinating. For that C of N sequence, are there any numbers that seem to be likely to show up as terminal values? Nothing, nothing special, no. Well, you, you can identify when, um, when you get a one, but no, nothing, nothing non-trivial. I had a comment about your uh, secret coloring algorithm. Yes, yes. The, well, the, well, yes. It's uh, what we do is we look. We, we look at the the um, the average the centroid. Look at how far the centroid of the cell is from the center of the picture, and that's some distance. That's roughly the average distance of that particular piece of of glass from the center of the picture. And we look at all those distances and put them into buckets and um, assign co random colors to buckets within a certain range. And we try to choose well, colors I'll so that it. we we try we try to choose colors so that we get something that it looks um, something you some, something you might see in a church. Or when we were doing this for frames, 
we choose a color scheme so that we get the kind of colors you would see in the frame of a painting, sort of browns and grays and things. We can adjust the palette. Right. And um, you need to have um, uh, an algorithm that determines whether or not colors are distinguishable, if they're going to be near each other. Uh, my comment is that you should uh, uh, suppress lime green because the, uh, the human visual system responds to that very, very strongly. And it oh. comes out as uh, um, overly garish. Lime green, thank you. I'll make a note. Hmm. Is, is a motto, if, you cannot, if, we, can, if you, we can't solve it, uh, let's make out of it due to you? Uh, I think so. Was it me or, or you, Scott? Okay. So I think Scott said that he can't. They, he's we, after working on these problems for a while. He said he can't wow. get interested. He, he can't get interested in a problem unless it produces a beautiful picture. Okay. So this is Neil. I suppose this is like the the official stopping time for when you were supposed to be done talking. Uh, if you're happy answering more questions and people have them, we have time to continue. But I don't want to make you suffer in your hot study any longer than is required of you. So how do you feel about answering more questions if people have them? Oh, delighted. Okay. F far away. Are there any what? more questions for Neil? Yeah, I have a quick question about the gasket. Uh, so you you showed pictures where you start with a triangle and also where you start with the square, either sy symmetrically or not. Uh, did you make any pictures with uh, other regular polygons like pentagons? Uh, good question. No, we didn't. Please go ahead. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think. Yes. There's a lot of room for playing around with other shapes and other other constructions. All right, well, if there are no other questions, uh, I will. Uh... Yeah, let's unmute and thank Neil again. Yeah, everyone. Thank Neil one more time for thank you. our uh, first uh, uh, experimental, experimental speaker. Very, very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Neil. I'll go ahead mm -hmm. and end the meeting if there are no objections. And uh, we hope to see you all back uh, next week for the next talk. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for coming. Bye.